and to greet everybody, just looking at those who I can see. I love it when we're able to see each other close. So hello, Kim. Nice to see you. And also nice to see Tanvi, Picture, Harsnia, uh, and, uh, and Deepti. Nice to see you as well. Uh, and uh, others are great that we're all gathered together. And so I'd like to talk about this uh, COVID-19 under five headings. Uh, and um, um, as, as we uh, then move into it, uh, start a discussion on what this means for leadership. Uh, and I know, Prof, that you're going to ask me a few questions. So my opening remarks will be about 10 minutes. Uh, just to say that this is a new virus. It's not a virus we've ever seen before. It's not a virus that we've known about before. Uh, it's a coronavirus, and there are only six coronaviruses known to humanity uh, that actually cause diseases in people. One appeared in 2003, that's a bit like this one, causing a disease called SARS. Uh, and it was quite tough to get under control. Uh, and it involved very hard work by governments and by the World Health Organization. Then we had another disease called MERS that appeared some years later, also caused by a coronavirus. But the reason why I'm saying this is it's not flu. And there were a lot of countries that assumed that it was like flu and dealt with it like flu at the beginning, uh, saying, oh, well, we'll be a bit slow and we'll work out what's going on. Uh, and within the World Health Organization, the word was, take this virus seriously. It's dangerous. Uh, and don't treat it lightly. Deal with it very quickly when you find it. Uh, you don't hold back. Because as soon as you hold back, then the virus spreads. And as the virus spreads, it becomes more and more entrenched in society, and then it gets very hard to remove it. And the only way to deal with this virus is to fight it and to stop it getting stuck in our communities. Because once it's there, it causes real problems. And so the other part of the virus message that I'm saying is this virus is here to stay. And so we have to organize ourselves to be ready to deal with the virus. And so that brings me to my second heading which is about people. Uh, because this virus is primarily transmitted through the respiratory system, it causes disease in the upper part of your chest. Perhaps one or two of you have had it. Certainly people in my family have. And they get a nasty cough. Uh, and because it's like that, because it's, it's coming in the respiratory system and it's spread through coughing, it's really important that people learn what they've got to do to avoid getting this disease. They've got to be able to keep at least one meter apart from each other, especially in confined areas. You've got to be able to wear face coverings and wear them properly. You've got to be able to practice hand hygiene and then cough hygiene and cough etiquette. And got to be able to look after those who are vulnerable, particularly people with diabetes and high blood pressure. And it's all about people. It's about people coming to terms with this new virus, making sense of it in their own heads, and not simply saying, oh, well, this is rubbish. My government tells me I've got to do something and I'm going to do it different because I'm a rebel, like I was hearing quite recently from some people. No, this virus, it doesn't uh, respect rebellious behavior. It, it just goes on multiplying. It goes on being transmitted. And if a president says it's uh, not a serious virus, the virus doesn't care just goes on. And so I'm actually saying that we have to be working with everybody in the world as they make sense of what this virus means for how they've got to behave. And then they adapt their behavior. So it's 7.8 billion people in our world having to adapt their behavior at the same time as societies get on top of this virus. Jolly hard. And it's particularly difficult where I come to my third point, where people live in places that make it hard to control the virus. What are these places? Well, they are very densely populated settlements because it's so hard to practice physical distancing. It's so hard to isolate if you've got the disease. So densely populated settlements are very easy places for this virus to get stuck into, and they're very hard 
to remove the virus from as well. So that means, uh, it, it, a term that is sometimes used, I hope you don't mind, slums are places where the virus can become very deeply established. In India, it's in Mumbai, it's in Ahmedabad, it's in New Delhi, as you know, it's in Kolkata, it's in Chennai, and then it's in some other big cities as well, particularly in the north. And that, that is a, a real challenge. The virus also gets into places where people come together for their work, particular kinds of food factories, meat factories, fish factories, vegetable plants. They've all got COVID. And there's also COVID when associated with particular occupations, security guards, bus drivers, cleaners, people whose role is to serve others. They're exposed to a lot of individuals each day. And they get sick. And then, of course, people who work in hospitals or in residential care for older people, they're also at risk. So this virus tends to move around in the places where people work, in the places where people stay. And it's associated with poverty. Whilst at the beginning it was wealthy people traveling around, doing air travel and so on, as we've watched it during the last few months, it really is, really is poorer people who are most at risk, poorer people who are most likely to die. And so I'm asking everybody to recognize that this is a disease of poverty and to respond to it appropriately. And then to my next heading, fourth heading, COVID reveals the fragility of system in our society. It reveals the fragility of our food systems, of our systems for nutrition, of systems for providing remuneration to people who are on daily wages, poor people. It shows the fragility of social protection systems. And it shows the fragility also of the way in which we care for older people, the way in which we look after refugees, and the fragility of our prisons, because there's an awful lot of COVID in prisons everywhere. So fragile systems are revealed. And so what are we going to do about it? Well, the answer is COVID shows us the importance of public services that respond to the needs of the poor. Over recent years in development, there's been a shift towards a privatization of public services. There's also been a dismantling of public services in many countries. They're presented as expensive and wasteful and unnecessary. But I think that we're learning through COVID that because it is a disease of poverty and inequity, it's absolutely essential that in every society there are sufficient public services in order that poor people can get access to health care, can get better shelter, can get better living conditions, because otherwise that COVID is still going to be a threat to them for the foreseeable future. And so to my last point, what does this mean for leadership? Well, as I understand it, leadership for the future involves putting people at the centre of all our thought and action. Leadership for the future involves having equity and justice at the centre of what we're working for. Leadership for the future is about giving space and opportunity to people, whoever they are, wherever they come from, whatever their nationality, whatever their sex or their wealth group. Because unless there is equity of opportunity and unless there is opportunity for all then we're never going to have a sustainable world we're never going to have a world that is fair we're never going to have a world where everybody has an opportunity and so that has to be our requirement and the kind of leadership that i'm encouraging is leadership that is very much focused on people and also leadership that's focused on systems, because in real life, everything is a result of interconnected processes or systems. And these are systems that always involve people and not people working like machines, but people working as people with their emotions, 
with their fears and with their aspirations. And so the kind of leadership that I'm trying to encourage is a leadership that draws on our emotions, that respects our instincts, that puts equity and justice at the center, and that's about collaboration and collective efforts rather than competition and exclusivity. Almost always we find that women do this better than men, but men can learn to do it. They're not trapped forever in the competitive and bruising style that they often like, and that was given so much valuation in traditional management training. Collaborative, collective leadership is something we can all follow, and it's time now that we use our influence everywhere to get it valued in national government, in businesses, in scientific institutions, in civil society, in the United Nations, because it's the only way for our world to come through and for it to be sustainable and also supportive, not only to our children, but to our grandchildren and to their children and their grandchildren, because that's going to be our legacy. So thank you very much indeed for the chance to say some remarks. And now back to you, Prof. Yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. David, uh, for this uh, five-pointer uh, program, which brings to, uh, to you my first question. Uh, how do you think diplomacy is going to change uh, post-COVID-19 or during this COVID-19? How do you see uh, diplomacy and international affairs uh, getting hampered or how uh, is, it, is it going to be facilitated during this time? Well, I, I would like to talk to all world leaders and ask them, who are they leading for right now? Uh, and the answer should be that they're leading for all the people of our world who are being affected by the most enormous crisis, that uh, we're just at the beginning of it, really. Uh, and uh, world leaders should be leading for the people, not for anybody else, not for the rich not for corporates, but for everybody. So then what's actually happening uh, leadership wise? Well, somehow leaders seem to have got stuck. They're rather focused on finding reasons to be frustrated with each other and to be mistrusting each other. When if they were being real leaders, they would be leading for the good of all. And so diplomacy, ought to be working in overdrive, focusing on how to deal with market failures, on protective equipment, or on diagnostics, or on treatments, working on how to get cooperation on the development of a vaccine, and then testing of a vaccine, and then cooperation on how to make sure that poor people get the first opportunity to choose. There ought to be diplomacy, working on how to support poor countries, including countries in Southeast Asia who are struggling with how to make sure that there is equity, but they're not. So there's something wrong with leadership right now. It's not focused on where it should be. And there's also uh, a need for every citizen in the world to be actually asking leaders to lead for the public good. Uh, and then we might get some hope. I'm afraid I've become a bit dull on this, Prof. I'm talking about it all the time. But that's because I think it is the most important issue right now. Leadership for the public good and equity. Um, thank you, sir. Is there any question in the audience so that we might take up one or two before we wind up? Because sir has another event to go. Uh, Kim, I have a question. I knew, Kim, you would have a question. Yes. <laughs> uh, hi, Dr. David. Thanks a ton for coming and joining us today. Uh, I have actually two questions. I'm going to club them into one. Um, my question is, now yesterday I stepped out after a very long time because in Dubai we've lifted up the lockdown and the consciousness of, you know, what am I touching, the railing, the car, the doors. Um, my, my, what I'm coming to is that, is it the, the inherent R0 factor of COVID high, or is it because the habits are kind of uh, not very polished, we're not really aware walking around that it's taking things to a different segment, 
or you know is there something that we can do in terms of raising an awareness of uh, sanitization or is just that no matter what we really do you have to have your sanitizer at hand to keep you know something with such a high uh, are not away from us you're so it's so interesting the way you're presenting it uh, Kim because I think for an awful lot of people it's an unreal thing that uh, there is this illness that can be transmitted so easily through just particularly surfaces and then through coughing and uh, and singing. And so I actually think uh, a lot of people are at a phase where they are just not yet ready to accept this reality. I mean, in, in Dubai, there is a lot of COVID. It's in particular sections of the population who are living in very crowded circumstances. And um, it's something that the government is super worried about. Uh, but there has not yet been, I don't believe, a collective appreciation among the people mm. that they change their way of behaviour. So um, I actually see this as the big issue, is helping people all over the world to make the change not feeling guilty about the fact that they're not yet ready to wear a mask or to practice good hygiene, but simply just to lead them almost by the hand and just help them to understand why this is important. I think what's happening in schools is vital, what's happening in workplaces is vital, and then what's happening actually in public transport. But because this COVID has really only just started to be a new partner of us, with us in the world, uh, it is going to take a bit longer. Uh, and there's also a, a, a collection of people who are thinking, well, the vaccine will come along and somehow we'll all be protected. I just have to say to you, there's no evidence that a vaccine is going to be here super quickly. There's lots of work to be done. So we might as well all learn to live with this virus. And it sounds like you're focusing on this with great uh, care and interest right now. Well, thanks a ton for that, Dr. David. Uh, thank you, Kim. Anybody else who has a question? Uh, let me just check the inbox. No. Um, so I just, I, yes, sir. I'd like to give a shout out to Nigel, who's wearing a very nice looking mask. And uh, I'm impressed uh, with that. Uh, it looks like it's quite well fitting. It's come above the <laughs> nose. <laughs> A mask that sits below the nose is no good. And it's also covering right below. Uh, and um, he's wearing it and it's, it's good. And I think um, when we're in public, we need to do this. Uh, particularly if we're going into a shop or something like that, we should be wearing a mask, not for ourselves, but for the other people we're in contact with, especially those who are busy serving us. But sir, uh, there, is, there is one point I would like to bring out here. I mean, I hope this changes. I see a lot of people wearing masks, obviously below their noses. That is number one. And, all the, and some of the people covering their uh, face with a cloth. I mean, they don't use a mask. So is it appropriate to do it with a cloth? Obviously, I prefer people to wear proper masks because uh, uh, that is the best way to be and to make sure it's above the nose. You know, none of us would wear any other garment looking like this. This is no use at all. You should stop people who wear a mask like this and tell them to dress properly. And so wear it properly like Nigel is doing. Now, a cloth mask can be useful in reducing whether uh, the likelihood that you're transmitting the virus if you've got it without symptoms. Uh, the WHO has got some quite tight instructions on cloth masks, but my own judgment is that we can actually do quite well with about three layers of ordinary tissue in a mask and that can be very helpful, particularly if you're asymptomatic, but you've got the virus in your saliva or in your respiratory secretions. So I'm in favor of cloth face coverings, as long as they're worn properly. 
and I'm in favor of them to reduce the risk that you transmit uh, as a primary preventive measure. Uh, and Prof, I'm very happy to talk more about this, but also my colleague Twee, uh, who's on the call, because we're both very interested to encourage people to wear masks and to get used to it. We are very frustrated by people who say it's not manly to wear a mask. Uh, certainly, I don't think it reduces my manhood at all. Sir, we have a question which has come up uh, from... Uh, this is the last question I'm taking from Mr. Solanki. He's saying why people are becoming so careless as the number of cases are rising. Is there any idea to stop them? Let's just, uh, I want to be really real about this. I'm going to see uh, uh, if, if I can communicate this really clearly. During the last three weeks, the number of people reported with COVID has accelerated very rapidly around the world. And that is despite enormous efforts by countries to reduce transmission through restricting movements uh, and introducing lockdown. Uh, we're going to see some new massive outbreaks in the US and in Europe in the coming weeks. Because if people go on moving around and not doing physical distancing, there will be new outbreaks. I think that towards the end of this year, we will see a situation that is much worse than what we saw in March and April when the cases started to climb in Europe. And so I think there will be a huge anxiety and pressure on people everywhere over the next three months to be more serious. What we're seeing at the moment is still a bit of disbelief and a bit of irresponsibility. But because the global situation is going to get a lot worse before it gets better, uh, we, I believe, will have a much greater concentration of, pe on, of people's minds on the need to do better. I hope that young people in particular will put pressure on older people to behave in a more responsible way. And I see that women are more likely to wear masks than men in many settings, and I hope that women will put pressure on men to do it. It's just not reasonable for people to be irresponsible in the face of this threat. Back to you, Prof. Uh, so last question, I'm so sorry. Nigel is asking, uh, there is an article I read which says that virus might just disappear on its own. Is that true? I wish tomorrow this virus disappears. I wish tomorrow that we find a vaccine. I wish tomorrow that we find out that people who've had the virus are immune from getting it again. I wish tomorrow that everybody who needs to protect themselves against this virus can do so and that we don't have these terrible disparities between rich and poor. I wake up every morning sometimes dreaming that this terrible crisis has ended. Instead, I find that not only is the crisis continuing, but also that too many political leaders are pretending that it's a trivial problem that they can joke about and laugh about and continue political campaigning and all other such things despite the virus. I'm sorry, the virus is staying. Political leaders have got to get a grip. We've all got to learn to live with this virus. And we must truly understand that poor people get much worse affected than those who are rich. And we have to focus on this with equity and justice at the center of our thinking. Um, so here we uh, come and conclude the session for today. It was really uh, knowledgeable. I think uh, we have actually understood the real meaning of COVID-19 today.
and the five pointers which you gave uh, dr david uh, yes the virus is going to stay i never i i always tell people that virus is not going to go it's going to stay with us forever and we have to start living with that virus but we have to take precautions of course and everything is going to change and people are now coining the terms as new normal and the new world and new policies etc etc but at the beginning level initial level we all have to stay safe we have to be very precautious about ourselves and our environment where we are staying so thank you dr david once again uh, for sparing your actual valuable time for half an hour with us i know you are extremely busy during this time uh, can i ask uh, kim if you can just click a picture uh, dr david if you don't mind can we click a picture please with you an e picture uh, can everybody please switch on their cameras so that we have a clear picture with everybody if kim can click a picture that would be great done i'm doing it hang on keep okay. smiling <laughs> it's a good exercise yes all right we've got everyone in the frame so is done yes okay thank you david before we leave uh, please uh, the video would be edited and uploaded on the pmf mentors youtube channel uh, pmf mentors linkedin and instagram pages please do follow us for the next session until um, we say uh, we meet again and stay safe stay healthy please take care of yourself and take <laughs> take precautions next session is going to be with the iron lady of india dr kiran bedi the lieutenant governor of puducherry and uh, just informing you also that you can just put your word it's on 4th of july 5 pm indian time thank you dr david once again and i see you very soon thank you sir Thank Dr David thank you so much i just wanted to say something that i'm really pleased and uh, uh pleasantly surprised that apart from you know this the stats of covid you brought about the importance of compassion and i think that's what the entire peaceful mind foundation is about that we bring that in so thank you so much for reiterating that for us so your mic so your mic one it's really our pleasure to be with you and we would like to stay connected with you we love the fact that you are mentors and that you believe in peaceful mind without peace their humanity is not going to be able to get through the many challenges it has they've been put here for us to work out how to deal with and peace and love is the only way through so thank you very much indeed yeah. and with thank you so much See you everybody bye. bye thank you bye bye bye